Point out the colors in you. I see them too, and boy, I like them. I like them. I like them. We way too fly to partake in all this hate. We out here vibing. We vibing. We vibing. Alexa, play Ariana Grande. Okay. With Amazon Music, a voice is all you need. Get tens of millions of songs. Download the Amazon Music app today. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Damn You Hollywood, where the quality of these films is matched only by my enthusiasm for this show. <laughs> Both are very, very low. Oh, we, everyone got that. Why did you ruin it by explaining it? Because it's only funny if you explain it. We, we've had this discussion. It's not funnier if you explain it. It, it actually lessens the humor the more you explain things like like the more you talk about a thing the l- the less uh energy it has to be funny i'm this is like the exact opposite of all my experience with comedy ever really i mean yes things are only funny if they are explained huh I feel like that's not true, or you would be a bigger fan of Seth MacFarlane. And now for t- to Robert Winfrey's ten-minute rant on why net t- Seth MacFarlane's not funny. I'm not going on a ten-minute rant about Seth MacFarlane. He doesn't merit that much attention from me. Mm. Do I merit any attention from you? Yes. That Yay. said, when I when I have laughed at, at Family Guy, it's mm-hmm. been when they have really explained stuff because yeah. I think it's funny. You know what, um, the, like, over-explained thing I thought was really funny? Uh, when Stan's dad on South Park yells out, they're raping me and it hurts. Like, <laughs> you, do you really... I don't think I've seen that episode, but... <laughs> they're, they're raping me! I think it's the Christmas one with the, Chris, with, 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 the, with the Christmas critters that are all possessed by Satan, and they're all, you know, raping the character and he's like they're raping me and it hurts like did we really need the it hurts part but you know that's I mean, what made it funny it's yeah again like that that joke is only funny with that addition see it's yeah. funnier when it's explained further all right i'm i'm with you now what do you say we start we start the show what do you think uh i mean we could but who cares what we think about a crappy movie oh wait that's the entire premise of the show isn't it kind of yeah all right Self-effacing humor aside, Mark and I are back after a few weeks on hiatus. And uh, we're better than ever! Um, as I said to you before we started the show, I literally napped sleep sitting straight up waiting for the show to start. So, um, I guess I'm okay? That's good to know. Uh, anyway, I'm Robert. He's Mark. 
I saw Hopefully White Boy get- Rick. I saw White Boy Rick. I saw Predator fr- um, Friday night, and then I saw White Boy Rick on Sunday. Okay. I mean, you saw two terrible movies at different ends of the spectrum, but okay. See, I wasn't sure if you if you wanted if you had any interest in White Boy Rick or not. I didn't no. bother to ask you because I figured the answer was going to be no because you don't like anything. But um, true. <laughs> but uh, I did see it, and not as good as I thought it would be. Yeah, you know, I, I like the true, the true crime autobiographical movies, but this one was just kind of meh. I mean, I'd, I'd have been more interested if it was Matthew McConaughey playing a teenager, just because I think he could pull it off. Matthew McConaughey yelling at a pantsless girl saying, get in the house, we're going to get custard, was pretty funny. Kind of movie kind of goes downhill after that. I would, I mean, like, I watched the trailer for White Boy Rick and went, okay, so as soon as we get away from McConaughey and into this obnoxious teenager being an obnoxious teenager with other obnoxious teenagers doing drug-related things, it's just going to go off a cliff. Though uh, I do enjoy that one line from the trailer, and it's it's funny in context. It's like the, 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 this, my boy Rick. He white, as though <laughs> the obvious pigmentation of his skin. Sometimes, sometimes things need to be over-explained. Ah, huh? see how we come full circle. Yeah, we're good like that. Anyway, we're not here to discuss white boy Rick. My attention deficit disorder aside, why don't you tell them what we're here to talk about? <sighs> Yeah, we're here to talk about the Predator. Woo! Um, don't woo, Mark. This is not a woo movie. Olivia Bunn's mu- Olivia Munn's buns, hun. Yeah, I like to get up in Olivia Munn's buns and go yeah. like Richard Nixon. The second time I've made that joke. Yes. Which I utterly stole from Andrew Dice Clay. Also true. Have you ever heard the original Andrew Dice Clay joke about him sticking his face in people's asses and being Richard Nixon? Probably at some point. Were you a fan of Andrew Dice Clay? Eh, not really. Did you watch his Showtime show that lasted two seasons? No, no. It was no. amusing. Not nearly I mean, as amusing as, as the as the idea of sticking your face in Olivia Munn's buns and, you know, and wiggling it just a little bit. You're... Bizarre obsessions aside. <laughs> I promised Jesse Starcher I would obsessively talk about Olivia Munn's buns. So I Why feel would like, you do that? Because he asked me to. I feel like I've met that quota. We can move the so show wait, on. Wait, 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 wait. You decided to further debase yourself in this particular forum. Oh, I would debase Alienate my- a significant portion of the audience by being you. To be fair, I, I alienate the other half. Well, hang on. Stop for a second. Simply because Jesse asked you to. Nobody listening to this show is going to be alienated by anything I just said. Or they aren't listening to this show to begin with. Feel free to tweet Mark if you fi- if you disagree with his perspective. <laughs> yeah, please let me know if you were all into this show. If you were like, I love Damn You Hollywood. But, you know, you sticking your the idea of you sticking your face in Olivia Munn's buns was a bridge too far. Yeah. You'll be Please. one of the you'll be one of the I'm people downvote like, you'll be one of the people downvoting me on YouTube, I bet. Yeah, those are just bots at this point. I, <sighs> we have like an equal number of downvotes and upvotes on YouTube because there's an equal number of bots out there doing both things. Like no one actually listens. <laughs> Do you think we you know, we put a humidifier and a, a, a humidifier and a dehumidifier in the same room and let them fight it out? I mean, nothing would change. That's the kind of the joke, I assume. Yeah. It's almost as much fun as watching the air conditioner fight the heater, though that can create many tornadoes. I wonder if anyone listening to this podcast right now is wondering how how long is this going to go on before they actually talk about the movie? Could they yeah, go in? An, could they go an entire show and not talk about the movie? We could. We <laughs> absolutely could. In fact, I think we did at one point, but you didn't record it. We we could we could easily fill an entire hour's worth of mindless banter between the two of us and arguing and not actually review a show, review a movie. Yeah, but since we've now filled our quota for pointless banter in the beginning of the show... You're welcome, Dad. On to the Predator. The Shane Black written... You direct this too? Yes, Yes. you did. Uh, that actually explains a lot about my of my problems with this movie all of a sudden because I <laughs> uh, I'll get to that 
Uh, they're attempting to continue the Predator franchise, which still, after having its first entry in, what, 1987? The original Predator? 90? Something like that. After its original movie, has still yet to have an, a decent sequel. <laughs> there's, there's just none. It's the saddest thing in the world that this franchise can't get another decent movie up and running. Because Predator 2 was hit and miss, to say it charitably. Predators was like 20 years later than that and also full of problems, including random Lawrence Fishburne appearances. <laughs> and now we've got this, and that's not even counting the Alien vs. Predator 2 movies, which are... Yeah. So bad. Just so bad. Anyway, Mark insisted on this movie being on the calendar because big budget release. Never mind how much it's going to suck. We must review it. I must suffer. This is the mandate of Mark. That's one of those things like on Mark's daily schedule. Is how can I can I exacerbate Winfrey's suffering today? Did you see what I put on Facebook when I when I was checking in? You know, I uh well, it was it was for White Boy Rick, but I had said, you know, one for one for the network, the Predator, one for me, White Boy Rick, and none for Robert Winfrey. Yeah. Yeah, so I just figured it was an accurate stream of consciousness post from you. <laughs> uh all right. So you and I both, we talked a little bit about this. Neither of us think this is a good movie. Let's just get that out of the way before I do my plot synopsis. But what would I'll, I'll be straight. As soon as I saw a trailer for this movie, I went, oh, this is going to suck. Like, there's no way this turns out decently. I just wasn't excited for it because here, here's the thing. The original Predator was this, this really fun mashup of a slasher horror movie and a science fiction and commando. You know, it was like, it was, it was really, really unique in that sense. And then they never really captured the magic of the first one, any subsequent one, because they're either, it's either a PG-13 movie where there's not enough gore and not enough slashing, or they don't come up with a, with a new and original way to use the Predator. So, you know, all they've ever done is change the setting in which the Predator exists. You know, in one instance, he's, he's in the middle, he's in the big city, Predator in the big city, uh, you know, amidst a gang war, and then, in a, and then they're like, well, let's, let's... Well, we have very stereotypical versions of Colombians and Jamaicans engage in a dr street war over drugs. And then in the next movie, it's Predator's... Uh, you know, killing aliens with humans in the middle in a hidden temple that affects nothing and nobody anywhere. And then in the next one, they're like, what if we put the Predator in the suburbs and there's aliens? Which would have... In fairness, in fairness to AVP Requiem, every time there's not humans talking on screen, it's pretty good. Well, that's the thing. Like, had AVP just been an all-out gore fest and had it been like a hard R, there was potential there. There was absolutely potential in Predators and Aliens tearing up the suburbs. That's fine, but again, not, not, not a, they don't commit to anything with these movies, which then brings no. us to Predators, which is, what if we go back and do the first one, but they're on a, instead of being on Earth in a jungle, they're on another planet? Okay? <laughs> and Topher Grace yeah, is there. and hey, and... Topher Grace is here, and we'll cast Adrian Brody in the lead for some reason, and oh, Predator Civil War. Yes, this is such a great idea. Like, no. And so, that brings us to this one, which, which I, I honestly... Yeah, which I honestly had zero interest in outside of it's a movie that fits into the modus operandi for this podcast. Now, that said, this is such a gonzo, bizarro movie, I actually really enjoyed it. It's just not well made, well acted, or well written. It, it, it simply exists as this utterly fantastic failure that amused me for two hours because I'm an idiot. All right, I don't think we're going to get a better synopsis than that. Let's just wrap the show. <laughs> <laughs> what do you got to plug, Mark? <laughs> uh, okay, in, in all seriousness. Um, Here's your spoiler warning. I'm going to tell you what happens in this movie. 
and God, I can't even make this sound less in, like not inane. So here you, here we go. Uh, we open. This movie's so damn derivative. <laughs> I just, like I sat there watching this, going, "There's paying homage to what came before, and then there's ripping it off because you can't do anything differently creatively." And that's what we got here. But we open with a brief Predator gunfight in outer space between two ships. One opens a wormhole of some variety and jumps to Earth. His ship crashes. This is the impetus for everything that follows. As this renegade Predator is bringing humanity alien technology to help them fight Predators... Like th- it's just the dumbest thing in the world. Yeah, it spoilers. Really S- spoilers. There's an there's a predator who has decided to rebel against the predator empire that's that's coming to Earth, and it's going to take and it's going to bring humanity a weapon to fight the predators with, which is essentially the Iron Man suit. I just realized, like that predator, that one that gets like his face punched in halfway mm-hmm. through the movie, he's that jackass who puts like Asian carp in the Mississippi River. <laughs> like, you're the asshole who has thrown the entire ecosystem out of balance because you're a moron. <laughs> I mean, somebody sh- stupid like put pike in. Like, uh, this is a major problem in one of the lakes where I live because somebody like 20 years ago thought it'd be a good idea <sighs> to introduce pike into the, the Utah Lake. It's not a good idea. They eat things that eat algae, and now the whole lake's a mess. It's. All right, get back, get, get back to synopsizing the movie. All right. As the Predator's ship crashes onto Earth, it disrupts a hostage retrieval mission, question mark, because that's never explained. But uh, leaving one of the surviving military members, why the military was supervising a hostage transfer is also never explained, but hey, Boyd Holbrook is there. And that's important because he's the main character, more or less. Uh, his unit dies, and he is left having encountered the Predator. He escapes. He steals a couple of pieces of equipment because he wants evidence in case people think he's crazy. Which is actually, like, the only sane thing his character does the entire movie. <laughs> uh, he then... So he mails those back home shortly after he's apprehended by the government, who tries to slap a... Because, yeah, I saw an alien. And the actual government agency that knows about the aliens doesn't want him getting out and making noise about it, so they prepare to commit him to a psych ward and <clears throat> dismiss his all claims as the ramblings of an insane person. While in transfer, he meets his group of misfit ne'er-do-wells, because it's a Shane Black movie. There must always be a group of misfit ne'er-do-wells. Uh... I don't even remember their names. It doesn't there's matter. The, and there's the religious guy. There's... Was that Key or Peel? I can't keep them straight in my head. Um, I think it was Key, right? Uh, hang yeah, on. Key. It's Key. Yes. So, Key is there. He makes a bunch of bad jokes. Uh, Thomas Jane is there. I swear, when they wrote this, these characters, they didn't actually write them. They assembled the actors and said, Okay, you're all crazy workshop how that's going to look. And Thomas Jane just went, I got Tourette's, so I can just do whatever I want. Yeah, it's kind of... You know it would be funny if I just blurt shit out? Like, eat your pussy. Like, wouldn't it be funny if I just blurt eat your pussy out at Olivia Munn? Let's see what she does. And... so, And then Key goes, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll improv some jokes. And then the other two are just kind of along for the ride. I'll be the crazy Irishman who blows things up because, hey, we don't have to be sensitive about the IRA anymore in 2018. Nobody cares about being sensitive to white people. Also true. And you have the religious Mexican. Because Mexicans are religious. Get it? By and large. And you have, who was it, Nebraska? And then there's Black Guy. Yeah. (laughs) Who failed to kill himself. Which is hilarious. The, you know what? Considering the amount of black people I meet in the jail setting that fail to kill themselves after trying on a number of occasions, highly believable. Most believable thing in the movie. Uh, I mean, he had a gun. Like, 
Again, I've not, again I've heard this story before. It, ha- it it's a thing. It happens. Move on. All right. I will bow to your superior experience with the suicidal black community. Yes, I'm quite experienced. I have I have an honorary doctorate in suicidal blacks. And in fairness, it does turn out he's just bad at shooting people in the head. Like, this is just some congenital thing with him, apparently. <laughs> uh, anyway, he, anyway, uh, Boyd Holbrook has has mailed these things to his P.O. box because he wants them, again, available to prove his story. Unfortunately, he's a deadbeat dad, and his he's behind on his alimony, and he's behind on paying off his P.O. box. So the post office just dumps all of it at the address which is his ex-wife, never quite estranged, if nothing else, and his autistic son, because we must, must for some reason, replay autistic people have superpowers. (laughs) (sighs) Just the... Also, just the dumbest thing. But... So the autistic kid who miraculously interfaces with alien technology, this is almost as stupid as Jeff Goldblum like just plugging his laptop into the alien computer. Hey, look. Will Smith saw the, the, the spaceships fly, and he understood instinctually how to then fly them. Yeah, I, I was more online with that because they had clearly like done some retrofitting to that one. It's also, if you watch the director's cut of Independence Day, it makes more sense that how Jeff Goldblum's character had translated that stream of, you know, lines into binary so he could theoretically interface with it. Like, it that actually makes more sense than hey, I'm a, autis- uh, autistic child I'm interfaces aut- with alien technology. Yeah, I'm autistic. I understand a, an alien language and its technology. Yeah, it's... Oh, God. That, that Every autistic kid I know is a mutant. Clearly. They all have special powers. Some can turn people to ice. Some can turn people to fire. Some shoot ruby... Re- some shoot red laser beams from their eyes. But uh, they have to wear ruby red quartz sunglasses in order to stop from doing that. Others are... Tell- Every kid on... The, the, honestly, the, the uh, emotional spectrum... The autistic spectrum, whether it's Asperger's or, or, or autism or whatever in between, all actual mutant powers. I don't know if you know that or not. As someone in all likelihood on the spectrum, yes, I knew that. Now I have to kill you for exposing our secret. What is your what? What exactly is your X power? I can't tell you. Oh, it's just, annoying you to death. What? Why don't you just whisper it in my ear? It's annoying you to death. I annoy people until they actually want to kill themselves. Uh, I could definitely see. You know what? I would argue that that's not a power, but as we saw from Deadpool 2, uh, if luck can be a power, so can annoying people to death. Just, like, general, I mean, just generally bringing down a room. Like, you, you drop me in the middle of something, and I have this aura of just nihilistic malaise that seeps out from me and inspires suicidal tendencies in those around me. When you walk into a room, you suck the hope out of the room. The hope and yes. the happiness. Leaving, Just gone. Leaving nothing I'm but a, despair. I'm a black hole of all that is good in the world. Right. That's a fun power to have. Yeah, I kind of wish I could actually do that to someone other than myself, but alright. Well, stop doing it in front of a mirror. No. I, dude, I don't like mirrors genuinely don't like mirrors. You're a weird fucker. Continue with your plot synopsis. <laughs> what, mirror? Uh, I'll get into why I don't like mirrors some I don't want to hear why you don't like mirrors, weirdo! <laughs> I said some other time. Um, anyway, set against this is the government agency that rec- recovered the unconscious body of the, f- of the predator, takes him to a secured facility, because there's no way this is going to go badly. They abduct Olivia Munn off of the, out of the dog park. Olivia Munn's buns. I was waiting for that. Because, and this is also really stupid, she wrote a letter to the president when she was a child saying she wanted to be informed of any, like, space animals that they found. I mean, who would have been the president at that point in time? Um, let us assume oh, she's, let us assume she's in her 30s. That, is that, is that fair? Okay, so Clinton, which makes sense that he would keep track of what nine-year-old girls write him. Yeah, I would imagine that he's had her bugged ever since then. 
I mean, the notion of Bill Clinton keeping tabs on things that small children wrote him is not even the, even the creepiest thing I can believe him doing. Yeah, no, not at all. He would definitely he, get... He, he. Bill Clinton is definitely a president that would be waiting until she turned 18 so that he could get his face in her buns. Yeah, he's a, he's a terrible person. He, Bill Clinton is a rapist. Yes, yes he is. In fact, there were multiple allegations from his time as governor of Arkansas that he just paid off to go away. Yep. <laughs> this is and all pe- on the record. And people wanted him to have a third term. People would people would right now vote vote him back into office. They would vote a known rapist back into office. Yep. Yeah, I mean, they also wanted a third term from Obama, so people are stupid. Not all a right. rapist, though. That we know. Really? You, you're you're going to make that claim publicly? Well, I don't think he... Well, if he raped anybody, it would be other men. It wouldn't be a woman. And, it, and as we all have learned, it doesn't count if you do it to men. Right. Especially white men. If, Bill, if Barack Obama was out there raping white men, nobody cares. Doesn't that's make the news. Ve- that's very true. I mean, that, that's, that's facetious, but it's also, <laughs> like, sadly, is probably 100% accurate. This podcast took a weird turn. Can we get back to reviewing the movie? No, oh, the movie sucks. I'd rather speculate about Barack Obama's sexual predations. <laughs> 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 All right. Anyway, they abduct Olivia Munn, where she... And her first greeting upon arriving at this facility, because she's a biologist, despite not really... Never mind. I'll get into that later. The first thing she arri- she is greeted with upon arriving at this facility is Gary Busey is Gary Busey's son Jake. And Gary Busey's son is not nearly as ugly as Gary Busey, but still, man, that's a rough welcome. <laughs> oh, well, and, he actually plays the son of And uh, so this known scientist, this, you know, this learned person in biology uh, they've brought her in, and she says, "I know why I'm here. You want to know if an, if you want to know uh, who fucked an alien?" Yeah, because as they have been doing experiments on this predator that they have captured, they discover that there's some human DNA in there somewhere. Uh, the thing winds up waking up as a real predator shows up to murder it. Uh, the first predator goes on a killing spree, escapes the facility. Uh, as our group of Looney Tunes arrive on the outside because they wanted to question Boyd Holbrook over actually having seen the darn thing. People die. There's blood spilled. The Predator escapes. Olivia Munn shoots herself with a trank dart and winds up with said Looney Tunes who, after a series of what I'm, are supposed to be hilarious quips, decide to go to Boyd Holbrook's place and retrieve the information, the, the evidence that he has so they can expose the existence of aliens, thus saving themselves from covert assassination by this agency, because once it's out, why would they kill us, as though there's no punitive people in this, in, in this group? So that's where they go. Uh, again, the, uh, one, another, a different predator arrives, this one much bigger and much more imposing, and able to manifest exoskeletal structures out of his body at will randomly um, as they retrieve the again I think it's a face mask and a gauntlet that the kid had as the kid is trick or treating with them because why not right I was going to say I don't know where this is set but like part of the country but that's a mild October wherever <laughs> they are that's a real mild October that they've got going on there let's say it's Florida it can't be Florida. There's no there's no palm trees. There's not always palm trees in Florida. I can go outside my house right now and show you that there's no palm trees. Yeah, because you live in an urban wasteland. I don't live in an urban... Just listen to me, god damn you. <laughs> <laughs> there's no palm trees where I live, I, but I, I live in a suburb of Tampa. Yeah, an urban wasteland, that's what I said. Ugh, you're, you're an urban wasteland. I, uh, no, I'm not. I'm not that interesting. Um, God, yeah, the the geography of this region is all over the place because don't they like have that last fight in like part of a swamp? <laughs> Again, Florida, Florida or, or Georgia, I assume at this point. Sure. Yeah, no, there is Georgia. They actually do say it's Georgia, if memory serves. Anyway, 
So they arrive, the big predator arrives and murders the little predator, and then has to retrieve all the evidence. For re- Can I just say, this was the, like one of my big gripes with this, the writing of this movie. For some reason, the big predator, after murdering the other one, the renegade, then has to re- report in to some nebulous entity and actually deliver plot points that we, the audience, are not privy to, despite never doing that before or doing it after that point. No other reporting is done. And to I mean, render that whole thing uh, redundant, three minutes later, the head of that whatever random shadow government agency it is randomly guesses at, at the correct solution on his first try. <laughs> I mean, it's not good writing. Anyway, so again, he murders that predator goes to recover those things, blow up the ship because the Predators don't want the humans to have this technology because it would spoil their hunting. I mean, again, this is also not actually explained all that well. I mean, it's entirely possible that this guy is just like, no, don't screw with the nat- with What is the prime directive? We can hunt them, but we don't interfere with their evolution. You're interfering with their evolution and we have to fix this. Uh, there's Predator dogs for some reason. Well, there were predator dogs in the last one, too. Sure, but, like, they don't... They didn't really make sense there, either. Like, hey, what would be cool? Dogs with mandibles and dreadlocks. Well, okay. Go In the, in the, the previous one, it made sense because, you know, you have Adrian Brody saying, you know, they, they're using dogs to flush us out as if we, you know, like we would if we were hunting, um, if we were hunting quail or something. Or uh, or foxes, so at least in the sense that this is a movie about pe- about humans being the game and a game preserve, it made some degree of sense. Having the dogs on Earth made no sense. Fair. I mean, uh, uh, unless uh, these are not hunting dogs, these are police dogs, and the the predator that was you know like really this is a noir piece, and that the and that the big hulking predator was actually like. You know, uh, you know, a detective predator. You know, who was on a case. All right. Anyway, things go, you know, badly. Uh, but because it's a Shane Black movie, there must be a kidnapping sequence. So the government agent kidnaps Boyd Holbrook's son to utilize his superpower as a means of integrating with the alien ship, so they can get in and find the technology. Because this. Man who can't interface properly with this machine and like doesn't actually you know shoot weapons appropriately has somehow managed to use Holmesian deduction skills to figure out the interstellar politics that went into the sequence of events that brought them to this point because the plot says so uh, as they are at the ship. There's a firefight that breaks up between Holbrook and his Looney Tunes and the government, and then the Predator shows up and murders all of them. With the exception of Boyd Holbrook and Olivia Munn, who, between the two of them, managed to save the day at the last minute with an explosive device, kill the big Predator, retrieve the alien technology, which is the Iron Man suit Mark 57. <laughs> And Boyd Holbrook gets to look at that and go, that's my new suit. Boy, I sure hope they have it in my size. I'll take that in a 42 long is what he says. I hope uh, they have it in a 42 long. Uh-huh. Um, so is this like a thing in Hollywood now? Is this like the new trend that in our action movie, somebody has to jump on a thing that's taking off? It would seem that way. Because Mission Impossible, Mission Impossible, Predator, I, 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 the next Avengers movie I'm sure will have it. Is the, like this this apparently is the new blue laser in the sky. Yeah, it's it's just not necessary. Do people I mean, understand the force it takes to get an aircraft moving? And that no, uh, they and the, don't. And that a hu- and that no human that once an aircraft has taken flight and has gotten to the speed it needs to be. I mean, like I'm not science guy. This is your department. But even I'm no, watching no, this and I'm like, I'll take a break from being Mister Wizard, and you can. I no. If you're if you're on a spaceship that's get, that's got enough velocity that it can actually take flight, you're not staying on it. You're being blown clear off the thing. Yeah, it's 
it, it's so stupid. It really is. Boyd Holbrook's hair doesn't even move. Yeah, they don't even have the decency to have a wind machine going. Okay. Oh, and that's the other thing. Like Alien, that was the other one where they're fight. I mean, as cool of an image as it was, that was another movie where the they're you know fighting on top of a spaceship that has taken flight. Yeah. No. This isn't a hover. Will, will these aren't hovercrafts. Like if it was and a hovercraft, least... if it was a hovercraft, like I get it. It's there's no necessary. There's no velocity here, but these are all things that take like jet propulsion. These are things designed to leave atmosphere. Like, no, you're not staying on them. I, I will say this about the alien ones. At least then they had the decency to tether themselves. Right. Which doesn't actually help you stand up or maintain a base for shooting from. But at least you're you're not going to fall off the ship if you're tethered to it. But no, yeah, it's, you're just you're just, just going stupid. to get your your body is just going to get blown to some of the rings by the force of the ship taking off. Yeah. I mean, you're just, you're just going to get yanked apart, but right. But you but <laughs> no. you won't fall off. Um, um, all right, where do, where do we really want to start with this thing? I mean, look, here's what I'll say. And it's badly. Can I just say this is like one of the worst edited movies I've seen in a while. Yeah, like, that entire everything after the predator reclaims the ship and is like, you know what? I feel like going on a hunt while I'm here. So uh, the one called McKenna. Yeah, it's clearly the the badass soldier. Wink, wink. No, it's the autistic kid because autism is the next step in human evolution. Apparently, yeah, autism is a superpower. Every autistic kid I know has awesome superpowers, and his life is so much better for it. Yes, uh, but yeah, that entire scene where they're going through the woods with that—it's it's so badly shot, net. It's so badly put together. Yeah, it's- this was not a well-made movie in the sense that. Like, the best part about it should be the action sequences, but they don't flow at all. Like, it's it's hard to follow the action. It's one of the things we've talked about with other movies, and it's probably my biggest complaint, other than that, you know, nobody nobody really acts this way. Um, but, you know, we've talked about it, you know, the saving grace of some stupid action movies where the plot is nonsensical is that, that at least the action is shot well and competently. This wasn't. This, you know, th- this I felt like they saved money on special effects by jarring the camera left and right. Yeah, the best parts of this movie are the stuff that the crazy that the crazy people, like the actors that ad-libbed all their stuff for those scenes. Right. Is the best part is like the best part of this movie. So, let me tell you what, at least what I liked. Like I said, I I enjoy, you know, a good gonzo over the top shoot everything that moves action flick. I liked... It wasn't done well, but at least I liked the attempt to try to flesh out the Predator race. That instead of them just being haunted house monsters, as they've been in every other movie, they were saying, hey, look, the Predators are a race of beings. They're trying to do things. They don't all get along. The problem is, again, they don't commit to anything. Like, a movie about the Predators, um, you know, and their society fracturing, you know, and one group of pred- one group of Predators saying, you know, we are destined, we need breathing room, <laughs> you know, I would love to see, like, you know, Predator Nazis, you know, and then a group, you know, and then the lesser Predators going, no, we we have no right to take over other races. Sure we do. We are big and strong. And fleshing that out somewhat and having, you know, and having that affect Earth would have been an interesting concept. And I feel like something they were trying to do. But it was like, it's as if somebody, like, it's as if a producer or an executive of the studio got the original script, looked at that, and went, this is way too much for an average movie-going audience these days. Take out all of this stuff, allude to it here and there, and then have Olivia Munn say, did somebody fuck an alien? All right. So <laughs> so we're not going to be brave and commit to an interesting idea. We're going to hint at the idea and then reduce the movie to caricatures and bad action. Yep. Okay, and at the, and at that point, like I'm just I I laughed at certain jokes. I enjoyed the shoot 'em up, and when it was over, I went home <laughs> and attempted to rewatch Predators, seeing as I have to review it on Thursday. I'm sorry, you having to watch 
both of those. Yeah, at some point I gotta I gotta do a palate cleansing and watch the original Predator. Yeah, which again committed at least committed to an idea. And the idea was, what if we took the slasher genre, but you know, but mix but mixed it with Commando? And oh, by the way, the slasher monster is an alien. All right, <laughs> but that's a fun idea. Um, so dear Hollywood, if you're gonna continue to make Predator movies. To figure out a far out idea to do something different and something new with the Predator race and then commit to it. Really, really commit. Because half assing it and then okay, just. Okay, wait, re- wait, 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 wait. This actually makes a lot of sense. What? Apparently, the film's third act was entirely reshot after test screenings of the movie. Well, you know, if they. if. If the third act was something more along the lines of what I'm suggesting and people rejected it, then we have nobody to blame but ourselves for shitty movies, and we've already talked about that several times in other podcasts. God, I hope they. I hope we get to see it at one point because, I mean, honestly, I just like seeing the differences for the sake of comparative analytics more than anything. It's one of the reasons I want to see, you know, Zack Snyder's version of Justice League. I don't necessarily think it'll be better, but I'd, I'm curious to see it. Uh, can I also petition relative to this show, Mark? I have a random petition for you. Because they've decided to cut down Venom to be a PG-13 movie, mm-hmm. but they're going to preserve the R-rated release for, I think, like the Blu-ray or whatnot. Okay. Can we postpone reviewing that movie until we get the R-rated version? No. Come on, you know the you know the theatrical cut's going to be garbage. Here's here's what I'll here's what I'm willing to do though. We're going to review the theatrical cut. And I'm when not the, doing and, it twice. And when the Blu-ray comes out, if you want to do a commentary over the the R-rated version, I'm fine with that. Yeah, that's possible. Unlikely. Like I, I, that movie's going to suck. Uh, anyway, about this one. Um, what else did I want to say? Again, it's just badly edited. It's the acting. Reason, I mean, the acting is fine. I think the I think everyone does what what they can with it, but it's it's unfortunately it's just written badly. You know, people don't people don't act for that. For some way. reason, Olivia Munn becomes a you know tactical person. Like she <laughs> gains the ability to. <laughs> really knows her way around somewhat complicated weaponry with no discernible reason for this having happened. Right, unless so I, they... Uh, uh, unless, like, I missed the point where her... Well, she's, you know, got a doctorate in, in some form of, like, evolutionary biology with a minor in, you know, small arms fire. So, I'm... I've got an article up that ha- that talks about what the original ending was supposed to be. Okay. I'm trying to find. I'm trying to like get to the part of the article where it says what it was. Yeah, I'll just read this from the beginning. That would be nice. Uh, God damn it, computer is so. Low. All right. It appears crowds divided on editor the Rock'em Rock'em Splatterfest that finally answers the question: What would a Shane Black Predator movie be like? Turns out a Shane Black Predator movie is pretty much what you'd expect: funny, problematic, violent, especially in its third act, pretty damn messy. The messiness of the third act was probably my biggest quibble with the film. There's too much choppy editing, too much wonky CGI. Uh, too Are we much, sure this isn't what we actually got? Too much. That wheels, sounds like what we actually got. Too much wheel spinning. No, they're, they're talking about that. Too much wheel spinning, and the film finally feels tacked on and underwhelming. This double few red and red back the better screenplay, which is an entirely different and way more exciting final beat. In the film, the last scene finds Quinn McKenna learning that a rogue predator has gifted humanity with a predator killer, which turns out to be a suit of Iron Man-esque super armor. Um, obviously, the intention here was to set up a sequel, one wherein McKenna would use this eyesore of an exoskeleton to protect the world against a new wave of predator attacks. Oh, well, all right. In Decker and Black's original screenplay, however, the scene isn't there. Instead, McKenna, his son Rory, and Casey Brackett which is Olivia Munn, have all just survived the final attack of the Super Predator uh, when a helicopter lands. Out climbs Dutch Schaefer, Arnold Schwarzenegger, his face haunted, etched by pain. Dutch tells the trio to come with him, and when Rory asks, uh, me too, the franchise's second most iconic badass mouth says, especially you. Cut to black. 
I mean, that's uh, that's pretty stupid too, to be fair. But <laughs> it's not as stupid. Yeah, I don't really know where we're going with this. <laughs> Nowhere, because when we get to, the, and we'll talk about that when we get to the money. But I mentioned that this is one of my big gripes with the writing on this movie is that it's derivative, and there's a difference between again paying homage to the movies that inspired this and came before it, and then there's derivative. Then there's hey, let's repurpose some of these iconic lines. We're gonna have. Nebraska Williams say get to the choppers clearly in reference to this bunch of motorcycles and this will be funny I giggled it's not funny I giggled anyway you have laughed at much dumber things than that I have and here's a bunch of the score from the original Predator because we don't want to pay the guy to make a whole one for this movie <laughs> hmm. so here's a bunch from and in fairness the score to the original Predator is great but it again it just didn't it it just never felt like it got away from just riding on the coattails of of you know the original and that's not a good thing that's really not a good thing in this instance cuz it just reminded me hey I could be watching the original yeah that's the thing like I don't want to see a rehash of the original and I and I don't see I actually wanted to ask you this because you know, you you're into horror and you're into gore and all that, but like, how do you how do you deal with the horror franchises? You know, where the setup is that there's some monster running around a space killing people. Um, like, how do you differentiate that from movie to movie? Well, you know, keeping it fresh. I mean, if you think about the screams. The screams changed settings. The, it changed who the monster was. Uh, in relation to the victim. Um, and even Scream got a little derivative towards the end. What, you know, what, what, well, the... Scream's an odd choice because it is an inherent... like It's intended as a deconstruction in some respects, so right. its derivative nature becomes... It, there's a serious question as to how much of that is intentional right. satire and how much of that is unintentional bad writing. So look at... Let, let, I mean, let's look at, like, say, Friday the 13th, right? Where we have, right. A, we have a, a... You know, a, just what is it 10 you know at, at least 10 or, movies where you know it's a lot there's the, the the base i think in the the first spoilers the first one it's the mother right and yeah. then from subsequently on that it's it's the child reborn as this stalking monster and it, and the setups are always the same you have a group of individual you have a group of potential victims and the monster and a setting and all, and I feel like the only thing that ever changed with those movies was the setting. Uh, there's two things about those movies that change. One of them is the setting. The other is, and since you brought this up, one of the most important things about, especially a slasher franchise and the Predator franchise is at its core, like the Terminator franchise in some respects, a slasher franchise. Terminator differentiated itself going forward, but the original is a slasher movie in many respects. It's actually the quality of the cast of victims that is, in many respects, most important. There has to be something that you can be interested in or that you can kind of latch on to. And there has to be at least someone that you're rooting for. And then, you know, you, you can use a setting to add character to it. And then you need, you know, good kills. Sadly, in this movie, we're lacking a lot of that. Well, that's I mean, the thing. This is essentially a, a, an attempt to rehash the the original with less interesting characters. Like, these are... Look, you're not going to get much better than I Ain't Got Time to Bleed Jesse Ventura. Very true. You know, <laughs> that, that was... I was watching... Um, I, I think it was the Honest trailer for the original Predator, and they made a point to saying like, like these are all like a badass dudes. These are dudes like you want like if when you're a kid you'd want to play out in the, you know out in the yard. Oh yeah, you'd argue over who's you know, you, you, the, that cast of characters like comes out of a nine year old boy's imagination. You know when uh, when Arnold Schwarzenegger and Carl Weathers 
you know, shake hand, you know, high, oh, high that, five. That, that, hand, <laughs> that, that hand clasp into the arm wrestling in midair. Right. I said, like, if that doesn't impregnate every woman in the theater, I mean, Jesus. <laughs> It's so you know it, it's it's got so much testosterone in that you know what I mean, so it's like, he, so I think this is the problem with the predator is they haven't figured because the predator is a specific time kind of monster it hunts other humans but it only hunts humans worthy of uh, of being hunted, so like it made a point like they made a point of not killing Olivia Munn because she you know she was naked and harmless and whatever else and you know and anytime you've ever seen the predators i think except for maybe requiem which i vaguely remember um the predators aren't really killing anybody that's inconsequential they're only only killing other uh you know other people who who could be potentially dangerous and it's like Okay, you either can't do that anymore, and then you have to change the modus operandi of the Predator, or you have to, you know... Th- that was the thing with Predators. It at least tried to do something interesting with that concept. Like, okay, let's go back to... Let's, take, let's, let's find the most dangerous individuals from these different walks of life. You know, and then... The, much of that movie plays on their interactions. You know, Walton Goggins interacting with... The uh, the character from who you know from Sierra Leone and uh, and all of that, and then you had you know the the Mexican and the Yakuza and all that. Um, and this one is like if they'd done any research, they'd know that Danny Trejo is not the most dangerous person from that walk of life. He always dies. <laughs> my my point is, I feel like the only thought they put into this was, you know, like okay, well, what happened? Like, well, let's take the same concept, but let's make all of them crazy this time. So it's like what you know. <laughs> so the thing that's going to differentiate this movie from the rest of them is that these guys are lunatics on top of everything else. Like, no, that's that's not enough. That's not enough to warrant an entire movie. No, it's again. I, sadly, like we don't even get a lot of really interesting kills. <laughs> no. Which I and I love a good gore fest. I wanted more. I really did want more, and mm. we just never quite get it. Like, uh. right, that's the thing. Like, well, that's what I was saying before. Like, if you're not going to write like an interesting script, but at least make it visually appealing, you know. And in in this particular case, you, you know, you gotta you gotta write you gotta make some fun kills. You know, Rambo coming out of the mud to slice a guy's throat. That's fun. That's a fun visual. Things like that, but. I, I, at this point, I feel like we're just repeating ourselves. This one, you know, was a... It's a mess. <laughs> it's a waste. Yeah. I yeah. I, I, at this point, I'm, I'm at a point now where a lot of people are with Jurassic Park, where it's just like, that's, there's nothing more you can do with this. Like, to, to paraphrase the guys from Red Letter Media with regards to Star Wars, this is very limited. There's nothing more you can do with it. Stop making Predator movies. If you're not going to actually, you know, make a good one, just stop. The next you're not doing yourself or anyone else any favors. The next movie, if they're going to do another one, the next movie has to be a hard R. It has to be gory as fuck, and it has to feature. It doesn't it, have to be. Let me be clear about this. It doesn't have to be over the top gory necessarily. If you can use limited gore effectively, I mean, again, consider the original. There's not that much gore what there is is used very effectively and it permeates the overall feel of the movie without bombarding you with I don't know, actual viscera that's like, like this one you, this one was rated r but i feel like it was rated r because of the language that was being used not because of anything that was on screen i mean there's a handful of violent deaths i mean there's the guy who gets sliced in half there's that scene where a bunch of blood just drips onto the predator there's the ending for thomas jane and uh, Key's characters where they're Which, pretty vi- mm-hmm. they're violently eviscerated and then mercy kill each other. Right. I don't know. I I I didn't see anything on the screen that was that that really that I felt made effective use of the R rating. Um so uh, I, well effective use is a different discussion. There was stuff on there that made it an R, but I, I'd agree with your point about efficacy. So again, make good use of the R rating. Make you know um and do something interesting with the Predators. Explore the Predator race more. 
I, you know, I think that's the thing. I think they feel like the audience for this thing isn't going to sit through a lot of predators talking to predators and then subsequently having to look at subtitles. Like, oh, what is this, a foreign film? What is this, Amelie? I'm not watching this shit. Uh, yeah, yes. it's... I just, compla- I just compared The Predator to a French film. Yeah, I know. You actually, like, short-circuited my brain for a minute. <laughs> a little beach ball showed up on your forehead. <laughs> yeah, something like that. It's... I mean, I agree with you. Like, there's... If you're going to try and make the Predator's politics part of the story, we have to spend time with them. We can't have humans randomly guessing well, and I would, miraculously being correct about what what's I, going on. What I would like to see the next movie, if they're going to do another one, start with is give me a, like, give me like ten minutes of Predator's like like a, a um, edited together of, of sequences of them hunting other aliens and then injecting themselves with, like, that DNA. Like, I would like... I want to see the Predators, like, go after some other alien races besides the actual aliens, besides the xenomorphs. You know what I mean? Like, let's see the Predators do different things. Show me a Predator homeworld. You know, do, like, sp- give, me the, give me 20 minutes, 20 solid minutes of just Predators doing yeah. Predator stuff outside of Earth. Yeah, but I mean, again, like, if you look at, you know, um, again, the second Alien vs. Predator, Alien vs. Predator Requiem, the parts of that movie without humans are pretty good. There's some stuff in there that's pretty solid. Then we spend so much time with these characters that are flat, unlikable, badly written, badly acted. Like, no, we want to see the aliens... I see the xenomorphs and the predators tear each other apart and a lot of collateral damage. We don't need the drama of, you know, the ex-con reuniting with his brother and the, you know, the mom soldier home on leave and, oh, they're so, you know, wacky as they get together trying to escape the carnage. Like, no, we don't need this. This is not what we're paying to see. I would, um, I, I would venture that it would be an interesting thing to see a full-on predator invasion. I mean, there's no way we'd, like, it would, but it'd also be horribly lopsided to be anywhere, belie- to be believable, like, we just get stomped. Maybe, but then that's the movie, isn't it? You know, it's it's in the first 20 minutes to a half an hour of the movie, the Predators come and, and you know, wipe out humanity, and then flash forward, you know, the, we are in the, we are in the waning days of a, of a resistance that's been, me- that's been crushed, but has at least survived this long. You know, and they're in their last ditch effort. Yeah. Can I also say that, like, the whole the, their stupid logic for like why why do they keep coming? Why is this predator trying to help us? Well, we're slowly killing ourselves because we have to sneak in a message about climate change. <laughs> yeah, I was really waiting for Damon Wayans to walk uh, to walk on screen and yell message. Okay. I mean, you had Key as in, as part of the cast right there. He should have just popped up in the background. Message. All right, you ready to talk oh, about the money? So stupid. And what little of it there is, yes. <laughs> okay, terrific. Here we go. There's your segue. Here comes the money. Here we go. Money talks. Here comes the money. Money, 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 money. <laughs> dollar, dollar. Dollar, dollar. I pressed pause on the right one this time. Woo-hoo. All right. Uh, on a budget of eighty-eight million, so far it's made fifty-six. Uh. 26, this is not good. 20, 26 domestic. I mean, it's far less than what they wanted, but I'm, I, I, I think by the end of its run, it'll, it'll make its, you know, it'll make about two hundred million, which is what it needs to be. I'm not successful. sure it will. You don't think so? I don't know. I'm really struggling to see this being all that successful overseas as well. I mean, like that's the other, that's the big markets, some of the big markets they're going for, and I'm not sure how this will play. Well, next week you've got Fahrenheit eleven nine. You've got the house with a clock in its walls, which is more appealing to kids. And then you have Life Itself. I don't think anyone's going to go see that. The week after that is Hellfest, Little Women in Night School, and Smallfoot. Uh, I mean, the, the question is not, is there any competition for this? The question is, even without competition, is anyone going to go, yeah, let's go see that again? 
Do you think anyone that was going to go see this has, has now seen it, and that's the end of that? Probably. I mean, what would be? I mean, you've seen it. I've. Seen, are you going to see this a second time? No, I don't, I don't even think I'd see this when it you know came out on uh, you know, on um video. I mean, I'm not going to see it again. Um. Well, maybe. I look. I I bet it makes it to 200 million, but then dies right there. So. Um, I. I don't know. Again, I'm thinking more 130, 150 range. Uh, Unless it was, it's a big hit in China. It was the number one. Um, it was the number one movie of the weekend. It knocked the Nun from first place to second place. A simple favor and White Boy Rick debuted at both uh, three and four. Crazy Rich Asians, which my wife saw twice, fell from three to five. Peppermint from two to six. The Meg, four to seven. Searching five to eight, Mission Impossible six to nine, and Unbroken Path to Redemption debuted at number ten. So that was how the weekend went. As far as where we, we it's, it's been a while since we've had one of these shows. So there's actually been some, uh, and yet nothing has changed. No, there's there's been some significant changes in the top ten for worldwide. Uh, Mission Impossible rose all the way to number five with seven hundred and sixty one million, which means there's going to be more of these. Get ready for more there was, Mission there Impossible. There were already going to be more of these. That it's, was it's, never in doubt. It's like it's Paramount's only viable franchise at this point because sure, sure shit ain't Transformers anymore. I'm just seriously hoping for the next one they kill Tom Cruise. <laughs> uh, like we, we can't keep doing this with him. Deadpool fell from five to six with seven hundred and thirty-four million. Ant Man and the Wasp uh, rose up to seven. With six hundred and seventeen million, so now that's profitable. Good for Marvel. Uh, Ready Player One fell from. I mean, it- you know, I was really worried about Disney until Ant Man and the Wasp kind of really has started climbing. The- <laughs> mm-hmm. There's a reason we didn't talk about the top four because they yeah. haven't changed. That, that's, yeah, I was like, there's no point. Um, Ready Player One fell from its fifth place spot to eight with uh, five hundred eighty-two million, and the last two are the same two uh, Chinese Chinaman movies that have been there all year: Operation Red Sea and Detective Chinatown Two. The Meg has risen to number eleven, and Sony, which just recently—I don't know if you saw this—but uh, they fucked up and, and lost the rights to both He Man and Barbie. Now, He Man. <laughs> <laughs> You lost the He-Man rights? Yeah, so the David Goyer He-Man movie has been scuttled. Um, I mean, who cares about Barbie as a you know, film property, but come on, man. Yeah, so Sony, lo- Sony lost He-Man and Barbie, and w- at which point Mattel decided to open up its own film f- uh, studio. So we are going to be getting bar- a Barbie movie and a He-Man movie, but it'll be under the newly branded Mattel studio, which will then get bought by Disney. It, it, three years from now, it's either going to go bankrupt or absor- be absorbed into Disney. It'll be absorbed into Disney. I can, I can almost guarantee. I, if you can, if look, if if Disney can sell you He Man toys in the park, they will. Oh yeah, if they get a He Man land going on, they would love that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, he Man's a vi- He Man's a viable IP. That you know, dust dust it off, rebrand it, get it out there for the boys. Like I said, I've, I've been saying this all year, and I'll keep saying it. They need Disney needs boy stuff. They've got the girl market cornered. They need boy stuff. They they do okay with Marvel. Star Wars is not doing so great. They're not moving toys like they should. They need another boy brand. Um, that being said. Uh, the Meg. That's why they have Marvel. But again, like Marvel, Marvel does okay, but they need another one. You know, they can't just they well, can't just considering rest- that the, considering that the whole next wave of Marvel movies is going to be designed to appeal to girls instead of boys. Right. That, that, see now that there's your opening right there to bring in another boy IP. Um, all right. So the Meg has risen to number eleven with five hundred and six million. Uh, Sony's only movie that's anywhere, you know, that's that's made any decent amount of money this year was Hotel Transylvania Three. Speaking of which, that's what that's what brought this whole thing up. Is Sony is Sony is they're a, still they're still banking on you know a PG thirteen version of Venom with we with cut down violence and a bunch of really bad jokes after every scene. I'm honestly waiting for Sony to get to at this point. For, for the Sony company to just sell their film studio to Marvel, and that way all the IP reverts back to Marvel proper. At, th- at this yeah, point... D- Disney's just looking at them licking their chops. Like, yeah, come on. Th- 
Yeah, Come and on. Like when this Fox Come deal, on. when this Fox deal is like totally fi- finalized and everything is integrated, Sony's going to be the next to go. It's at this point they're they're just subsisting on like whatever scraps they've got left. They're that they're they are. I mean, when when even Paramount is a more viable studio, Paramount has a top five picture for Christ's sake. Granted, it's the only one. It's, it's <laughs> you know the next best picture they've got is A Quiet Place at number nineteen, but still. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, so uh, Hotel Transylvania three with five hundred and three million dollars, Rampage number thirteen, Solo a Star Wars story, poor Disney, poor Lucasfilm at number fourteen, Mamma Mia, here we go again. At uh, 15, 50 Shades Freed, 16, Monster Hunt, 2, 17, Peter Rabbit, 18, Sony's other big hit this year, (laughs) Hotel Transylvania, and Peter Rabbit. A Quiet Place at number 19, and finally, uh, coming in at number 20, is Skyscraper. Yeah, it's it's not been a good year. Yeah, Christopher Robin's kind of bombed. On a, uh, I don't remember what the budget was, but it's only made 154 million, and it's like way down on the list. Yeah, it'll, it might eke towards profitability, but I mean, it was never. I have to imagine it wasn't intended to actually start a franchise. Mm-hmm. No, they're just making use of their IP, and yeah. you know their their game plan was to reuse all of their classic IP to do live action movies. That's okay. Mary, Mary Poppins. In fairness, they're, Mary, winning, they're being more successful than not with those idea, with that idea. I was going to say, like, Beauty and the Beast certainly makes up for your Christopher Robbins and your Peach Dragons. Um, well, no, it doesn't make up for Peach Dragon. That was... We, we, that was... Yeah. But, I mean, you have Mary Poppins Returns, which, thankfully, I don't have to see. Yeah, but that'll, that'll make money. Mulan will make money. Mulan, Mulan will, will do. I mean... Aladdin's coming soon. Aladdin will make money. Dumbo will make money. Dumbo might not. Dumbo's Dumbo's a bit iffy. Um, I mean, I think Christopher Robin might have done better, except that it was so dang maudlin. Like I don't I mean, like, it, like we well, talked I about mean, this during the review. Like I don't, I'm not entirely sure who this is meant for. It's not a kids' movie, <laughs> right? Like, and that's the thing is, like, Disney is the is the kids' fucking IP. Like, if you're not making movies for kids, who are you making these for? I mean, don't get me wrong; I really enjoyed Christopher Robin, but yeah, but again, we're like, under, we're, you can, it's pretty easy to see why it's struggling, right? It's a it's it's a weird movie that appeals to a ver- to a very small sliver of the pop of the movie going population. I mean, like we're movie guys, and I told you even if if we didn't do if I didn't have kids and I w- and I didn't have a podcast where I reviewed movies, I wouldn't have gone to see it. I would have, but that's just me. Anyway, Winnie the Pooh never did anything for me. Um, I would love to do more re- uh, more stuff here, but my fucking mouse has died. God damn it! Reconnect. I have a wire battery. I just did, and I've got a solid green light, which means it should be reconnecting. Uh, unplug, the, unplug the dongle. Plug the dongle back in. There's no dongle. It's wireless. There's a dongle. That, all right, I'm connected. Cloud connected. All right. Um, so anyway, going back to the release schedule. Next week is nothing but bullshit. Uh, I mean, like you know, the house with the clock in the walls is probably the be the number one movie of the weekend. Um, that's put up on Universal. The week after that is literally like a bunch of hot garbage. Um, it'll, you know, but I'm, I'll tell you what, Night School will probably end up being the number one movie of that weekend too, which is also Universal because people like Kevin Hart. I know you don't. I don't need a twenty minute rant about how Kevin Hart's terrible. Wasn't but gonna rant. People was just gonna say I don't get it, but I agree. But he is undeniably popular, despite my he, his movies. Ma- his movies make money. White people love him. He is successful. Um, and then Venom and a Star is Born. I tell you what, Venom is actually going to have some trouble, I think, in the you know, in uh, in its release weekend because apparently a Star is Born is also gaining a lot of traction. Like, I mean, they're very different movies, but yeah, sure. like, but you know, the point being, I think you're correct. I mean, a Star is Born is getting Oscar buzz. It looks to be an incredibly well made movie. It. The, you know, I mean, it's the, you know a musical dramatic romance. There's a lot of, there's a big section of the population that appeals to. 
Lady and Gaga. People, people like Lady Gaga. And I appreciate counter programming. I do, but if you're Sony and you're banking on Venom to be your hit, if it struggles against a Star Is Born, <laughs> that ain't good. Yeah. So, uh, with that being said, are you ready? Yeah, sure. Are you ready? No! I said, are you ready? No, God! No, God, please, no! 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 All right, folks, here we go. You've heard me and Robert tear this film apart, and now we're going to tear apart other people who tore this film apart. Right. Kristen Lopez of Culturis, the creature feature equivalent of white bread. I no, no, because I mean a, cre- a white bread creature feature would be just a generic creature feature. This is actually a bad creature feature. Like the creature is not actually featured. <laughs> Even in like, because again, like the original Predator doesn't have the Predator on screen all that much, but its presence is relatively pervasive. Not so much here. It's actually a lot more like that random... Can I just say, like, the fact that they built up that, you know, government agent in charge of that thing, and then he just kills himself randomly in a badly shot sequence that doesn't actually read as him accidentally killing himself was the dumbest thing they could have done with that character. Yeah, I had to, like, like read the wiki. up that way. I had to read the wiki. But first, like, first of all, I hated his character. Like, on the one hand, he was wildly entertaining in a clown sense. But on the other hand, I'm just like, you're a posi- someone in your job position doing what you're doing won't act the way that you do. You wouldn't actually have your job anymore if you did this. Yeah. Uh, Dan Merle of Screen Junkies, this obnoxious prick. <laughs> what... <laughs> Fuck you, Dan Merle, in your stupid in your stupid movie fights title. Watching this movie is as close to what I imagine going insane is like. I mean, did you not see a wrinkle in time? Because <laughs> seriously, Reese Witherspoon transformed into a stalk of romaine lettuce. You know, I know it's one of those movies you wish I hadn't made you review, but we've gotten a lot of mileage out of that. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, I'd rather have never seen it and just my mind would be cleansed of giant Oprah. Well, more so than giant Oprah from the 90s when she was you know, huge and fat. But, uh, yeah, we've been able... At least... Like, that, that's been my touchstone for bad movies all year. Is this worse than A Wrinkle in Time? No? I, I feel like if, if we do a show where we wrap up the entire year, the picture, of that sh- the picture associated with that show is just going to be Reese Witherspoon as a giant slice of romaine lettuce. It might be. Like this. We referenced this so much. <laughs> uh, Joe Lipsit of Bloody Disgusting. It's unclear if Black and Decker, he, he, so that he, he is actually in there. I didn't do that. I, I know. You, you wouldn't have inserted that. <laughs> We're aiming for 80s action movie nostalgia with their underwhelming dialogue and rah-rah machismo, but the vast majority of the Predator unfortunately lands uncomfortably close to dude bro territory. You know that's not actually all that wrong. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's that's relatively fair now that I think about it. Stephanie Watts, one room with a view. The story also seems fairly vague and spread across several different narrative threads that never quite add up. No one has a clear motive, including the predator himself, and this makes for confusing, tensionless viewing. No, no, the predator, no, no, the predator had a very the clear predator motive. Had a clear motivation, like <laughs> oh, they're trying to arm the like they're trying to give the deer machine guns. This is a bad idea. I'm going to stop it. That's relatively clear cut. Yeah, both predators had very clear motivations. I the, no, no, the other one had a clear goal, but why he was doing it was horribly unclear. Okay, I'm fair, going that's fair. to arm humanity because I feel kinship, like much like the clone girl at the end of at the end of Fallen Kingdom releasing the clone dinosaurs. And destroying the ecosystem of either destroying the planetary ecosystem or damning them all to horrible death because the 
current climate is not designed to support their existence because clone kinship. Like, that's got to be the same reasoning here, right? Oh, I have human DNA. I must, I feel kinship with these lower life forms and must therefore arm them against coming slaughter while never actually stopping them from wiping themselves out from, you know, due to, you know, vague climate change threats from government. Like, it's, he didn't make sense. The other one, all the sense in the world. Like, oh. Would his character have made idea. more sense had he showed up to Earth wearing a Save the Whales t-shirt? I want him to wear a Nuke the Whales t-shirt. <laughs> Tom Santilli of Axis.com. One could not have imagined that this franchise would sink so low as to introduce dreadlock predator dogs. But this film has two of them. I feel they, like that's moderately racist. No, but <laughs> this is clearly not someone who saw Predators, where they already had the dreadlocked dogs. Like, um, th- this is already a thing. Well, I don't think those dogs had dreadlocks. Those dogs had, like, horns on them. No, they had dreads. I don't remember the dreads. You're about to rewatch it, so you'll... Feel free to correct me if my memory is mistaken. I can hmm. swear they have something that's... Like, they have the dreads. I feel like it's just horns, but it's not worth really talking about. Uh, Jeremy Johns of JeremyJohns.com. Completely unbalanced. you loser. Yeah. Completely unbalanced. That's a vague enough description to pass for pseudo-enlightenment, I suppose. You feel good about writing that? <laughs> Um, let's see. Bobby Roberts of The Stranger, Seattle, Washington. It doesn't sample an outdated, cliched aesthetic. It is that outdated, cliched aesthetic. This is a $100 million Golan Globus movie in an incoherent cartoon full of slop and jank, drowning out brief sparks of charm thrown by actors who deserve better. Bear in mind, when he says actors who deserve better, he only means key because he's woke. Yeah, he might mean Olivia Bun- Olivia Bunn's Munns or L- Bun- or Munns Buns, as it were. Uh, it, that's the type of that's the type of reviewer who's in love with the sound of his own voice. Yeah, now, you, you can't take anything that guy says seriously because he's just talking to hear himself talk. Andrew Todd of Polygon, devotees of the franchise will get exactly the kind of creative predator action they've been craving. But the movie as a whole feels as though it suffered a death of a thousand cuts, hamstrung by rewrites and edits into a shapeless, unfocused mess. Yeah, as someone who enjoys the pr- certain e- entries into this franchise, I'm offended by that. <laughs> I did not get the Predator action that I wanted. I really didn't. <laughs> you, you've just cast horrible dispersions over anyone who remotely enjoys this franchise. Like, oh, I mean, the Predator kills people. You like that, right? No. Like, <laughs> no. That's, uh, that's not the same thing as saying, you know, small children are entertained by explosions in the Transformers movies. They are. That's just the way they are. Because they're children. They're supposed to be entertained by things that go boom. Patrick Sandberg of Dazed and Confused. This may be the director's best attempt at an alien invasion, but no matter how many grenades he throws, nothing ever lands. I feel like he's mixing his metaphors there. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure which one he's going for. Um, Graham Tuckett of Stuff.co.New Zealand. The Predator is a lesson in exactly how to trash the memory of a risible but lovable original. Yep. That's relatively accurate. Uh, Johnny Olinsky of the New York Post. Top critic. Racially oh offensive quips. Flagrant, oh, shut up. <laughs> flagrant sexism. <laughs> Shut and, Tur- up. and Tourette syndrome gags all contribute to this witless, scare-free junk. Oh, you who like to smell your own farts. Uh, I mean, I really would have preferred that, you know, there be no men in this movie, and uh, we had four Olivia Munn clones. I could deal with that. Of course, he couldn't actually say that lest he be construed as sexist. I mean, it, to, in all seriousness, to anyone who thinks that I mean, like, the scene where those guys are just, like, in the bus giving each other shit. Have... uh, Has this reviewer never actually been in a remotely similar circumstance? Because that's what they sound like. No, this New York Post writer has never had male friends. Yeah, it's... That's what got... That's... I mean, it's not the best... I'm not necessarily saying it's the best thing in the world. But 
guys kind of talk like that. <laughs> yeah, that was that was probably the most true scene in the entire movie. I might end with this one. I feel like this sums up the whole thing. Um, I'm gonna look to see if there's anything better than this, but I feel like this is the is the is the best one. Pat Padua of the Washington Post, top critic. Oh. Washington Post, okay. This is the like major mainstream news here. This is you know the Washington Post is the best of the best, and this guy's a top critic, the best of the best. Can't seem to summon up that old black magic. Really. <laughs> I mean, what are you referencing here? How does that sentence in any way actually relate to the material? I mean, I suppose you might be referencing... Sh- okay, he's talking about Shane Black's last name. Okay. I mean, does Black actually have that much great stuff in his repertoire? I mean, he's got a few. I'm not going to pretend he doesn't, but... Isn't it... the at this point, isn't he just like coasting on the fact that he made the lethal that he you know wrote lethal weapon? Um. Yeah, like this is the, okay. This is not. I mean, again, he's got a few decent. Again, he wrote lethal weapon, which is great. The Monster Squad, which is not. Lethal Weapon Two, which is pretty good. Last Boy Scout, yeah. Last Action Hero. Uh, pretty big fail. Long Kiss could not actually enjoy. Kiss Kiss Bang Bang is good. Iron Man 3, problematic. Um, Edge was a television pilot. I enjoyed Nice Guys, but yeah, this is, I mean, he's not exactly this lauded figure of the writing world. Oh my world. god. Christian Harloff, this fucking idiot. Okay. Of Schmoes No. Every Predator movie that worked took itself seriously. This one didn't, and it was a mess over-the-top sci-fi. I'm not sure that's... I mean, again, let's start with the fact that only the first one really works. And there's a significant difference between taking yourself seriously and the actors not winking and nodding at the camera every five minutes. The first one doesn't take itself seriously in the sense that this is a serious movie, but they just set they just make a serious. Jesse Ventura is walking through the jungle with a Gatling gun. Yes. And okay. There's a scene where he's where he's trying to pass out tobacco chew. No one will take it. He then refers to them all as slack jawed faggots. And that yeah, he ins- something else that I have no problem believing actually happened. Amongst <laughs> men. And then insist that if they that if they would only chew the said tobacco, they would make them suck. It would make them all a sexual tyrannosaurus. And I strap this. On your no one was ass. taking that movie seriously. Yeah, again, like there's a significant difference between the in- the, the stuff on screen being treated as relatively serious only in the sense that oh we're being chased by an alien monster I have to at least I'm an actor I have to act like this is really happening that's the only degree to which it was taken seriously yes and it was an important step and it was competently edited together yes by contrast here we have Key doing his best Jimmy Fallon impression where he looks at the camera and winks every five minutes (laughs) Uh, <laughs> but yeah, that, that's just a fundamental misread of the of the of what it means to take itself seriously versus what it means for a movie to be coherent within its own world. So here we have First Predator coherent. This one, not so much. Here we have Robert uh, Robert Winfrey's spiritual father, Roger Moore of Movie Nation. <laughs> Why would you do this to me? <laughs> the smart ass, quote unquote, Shane Black. And not the "quote unquote" smart ass Shane Black are equally represented here. I, I don't think I, I don't think I agree with that. But that's a really weird way to structure that thought. <laughs> I mean, you could have just said this was more ass than smart from from noted smart ass Shane Black. 
Um, Victoria Alexander of filmsandreview.com. The Predator begins its new life merging Iron Man comedy and the most essential puzzle piece and on the spectrum kid. What's next? Xenomorph XX121 speaking English with a British accent. Be afraid. Be very afraid. It's coming. God, I hope so. No. I really don't want that. I I really don't. I need a recreation of that critic scene where the dinosaurs are like. You know, um, like oh, we're going to be on a crude raft, and I'm going to t- you know t- do odd job. But well, again, maybe I've said too much. No, no one should recreate that shit. No, why would you even <laughs> put that out there to the unpaid intern listening to this? Do not. That's a terrible idea. Please I'm not, make. I'm not taking. I'm not taking moral high ground here. That's just a bad idea. <laughs> Please let, let the next Alien movie make a feature of them talking in British accents. With no. with spectacles. Uh, Brian Orndorff of Blu-ray.com. An unwieldy, unexciting feature that doesn't top what's come before. With Black, the unlikely architect of the brand's name's demise. Yeah, that's kind of fair. Uh, doesn't anyone have anything to say about Trump? For once, it seems not. And I'll just take that as a win. <laughs> um, it's bad enough we have the guy go, oh, God, they're, there's, they're making jokes. How dare they make jokes in the fashion that men would make in a locker room? Oh, I mean, do you need to retire to the duvet and clutch your pearls, sir? <laughs> uh, Mary Ann Johnson, a flick philosopher. Garbage. A bad excuse for a movie, even for the pulpy, disposable popcorn nonsense it wants to be. Incoherent and illogical, cheap and shoddy, wannabe sci-fi action horror that can't pull any of it off. That's relatively accurate. Susan Granger of SSG Syndicate, this broad. Profanity-filled, tedious addition to the sci-fi horror franchise. Where's Arnold Schwarzenegger when you really need him? I mean, if they had cast Arnie, you would have bitched about him being old and a symbol of the patriarchy. Kurt Loder of Reason Online. The machine gun muzzle flashes might have been important from 1987, year zero in the Predator universe. Yeah, can we just dispense with those? Because the actual muzzle flashes aren't that bright or that big. That's really a Hollywood thing. Uh, Leonard Malton of LeonardMalton.com oh. Okay, this has to be the last one. I, okay. I, I hate Leonard Malton. Genre fans may enjoy this as a weekend time filler or in the future on an airplane. I regret that I devoted nearly two hours to a promising picture that wound up being so mediocre. See, I wish you hadn't read that because now I have to agree with Leonard Malton. Because <laughs> he's not wrong, necessarily. Mm. Uh, Matt Brunson of Although Creative Loafing. Although they would Loafing. never show this on, let me. They would never show this on an airplane ride because they'd have to bleep out so much mm. of the dialogue. The script might be the worst in the entire franchise, but a talented cast and some exciting interludes during the first half slightly compensate for the rampant idiocy. This is not the worst script out of these movies. It's bad, but have you ever read the script for Predator Two? <laughs> I mean, if we're just talking the script, that, since we're limiting the discussion to that, the weary gang war, like Danny Glover as this wearied but still pseudo-badass detective dealing with the gangland homicides in you know south-central Los Angeles is really not all that good. You have, I love Bill Paxton, but <laughs> <laughs> his character, there's... It's really not a well-written movie. All right, this is the last one. James Vernier of Boston Herald. Alien vs. Predator was a lot better. <sighs> Hang on. <laughs> I, have, I have to legitimately decide whether or not I agree with that. It was not a lot better. It might be better. I, that, that, that might be a defensible point. Calling it a lot better just means it's been a while since you've rewatched the first Alien vs. Predator movie because. No. It, 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 there's not a massive distinction in quality here. <laughs> Alright, that, uh, that is the end of our Predator review. 
Tomorrow we take a break from Predators and we go back to the woods with Corpaclani, the new Corpaclani album, re- as reviewed on the Metal Hammer of Doom. And then uh, we finish up Predator Week with an on trial for Robert Rodriguez's Predators. Next week, Robert and I are back. It's not ag- good. Next week, Robert and I are back again to do TV party tonight for Iron Fist. We have the last oh, Iron. To... Hang on, hang on. Let, let me say this because I want to document this publicly. Oh no. Just let me. Do- I want to say this just publicly. Okay, that's all I want to do here about Iron Fist season two. I am two episodes in, two and a half. Don't tell me if I'm right or wrong. But I'm going to throw out a handful of guesses about various plot lines that I that have been revealed thus far. We're doing a depowered arc where at some point Davos is going to strip the power of the Iron Fist from Danny Rand, who has to find meaning in his life absent his magical superpowers. Because we've never seen that plot point done before. Uh, the random redhead who keeps running into Danny, we know, we know a little bit about her. She's clearly got... They're going with some kind of variant of dissociative identity disorder. And the big twist will be that the... the, the Ah, shucks, gee, golly, somewhat unstable one is actually the unstable, dangerous, obsessive personality. And the brusque... I, you know, I, the very brusque one that you're meant not to like is actually the one keeping her in check and telling her, quit being such a bitch. I don't want to go back to jail. Um... What was the other one that I had that I actually thought had a thought for? Oh, that random quasi-effeminate teenager that's following uh, Colleen around is going to wind up dead. Boy, I hope he winds up dead. Please kill him. I'm loosely interested in where Ward's uh, Narcotics Anonymous thing goes. The phone rings. Uh, but I- I'm really struggling with this season. I'm... I'm really struggling with it, so I'll have to suck it up and just plow through it at some point, but I am not enthralled. Have you watched it yet? I assume you've watched it all. Nope, not a bit. All right, so my random guesses there might have spoiled something for you. (laughs) It'll be fine. Uh, So like I was saying, next week we've got a pair of Iron Fist shows. We've got the last Iron Fist story by Ed Brubaker and Matt Fraction. Um, we looked at issues one through six. We need six. to do one of these. We need to do one of these for the BoJack Horseman television series. Yeah. Like one for each season, or one for two seasons, something like that. Because I watched that instead of Iron Fist, it was so much happier. I love BoJack. <laughs> sure. Um, and then we'll be reviewing the new therapy that takes us into October. First week of October, we've got uh, Deadpool, Dracula's Gauntlet on source material TV party tonight for Ozark season 2 and uh, Metal Hammer of Doom celebrates Halloween all month long with uh, one covers album per week the first one being Power Glove continue and that's uh, we've got a whole bunch of content right now in the can we've got the Book of Bad Decisions review by uh, Clutch on the Metal Hammer of Doom We've got, uh, we had a whole bunch of content land on Saturday. We had a Screaming Boy exclusive. We looked at the DC Universe over the top app. Then we did a commentary for Superman Doomsday. Uh, and then followed, following that, Pat and I did an impromptu alternative commentary for the highway robbery that was Canelo versus Triple G2. Highway robbery is a bit extreme, but. No. No, hey, hang on, hang on. Let me let me explain. Let me explain. You got the two minutes. Fight, the first fight, Triple G got screwed, flat out screwed. Adelaide Bird took a payoff, was driving around in a new car the next day, like that. That was criminal. In this instance, I thought Triple G won. Same people thought Triple G won, but Canelo, being the promotional golden boy that he is, the judges ne- were going to give him any round that they could reasonably find an excuse to give him that round for. And there were enough rounds that they could give him that excuse to win. I watched that fight with Pat. By the end of it, we both cl- we both were very secure in our belief that Triple G won. You want oh, as say- soon as that as soon as that went the distance, I thought Triple G won. I knew they were giving Canelo the decision. 
Well, I'm going to call it a highway robbery. You want to you want to say, yeah, that's a bridge too far. Fine. You're welcome to your opinion. But when you know when when a person who like half watches boxing and a person who used to be a boxing both come to the same conclusion and they still give it to the other guy, I don't know how else you. I don't know why you wouldn't call that a highway robbery. Except that you know, I don't know. I I, I don't understand your logic. I don't. Okay. Here, very briefly. Here's my logic. Canelo fought a great fight. I mean, again, setting aside the judging, he fought a great fight. Again, he, I thought he lost. Still he a great fight. Fought an okay fight. He fought a great fight. Come on. No. Again, you, you can fight it. You can have a great fight. You can fight a great fight and still lose. That's, oh, I agree. He didn't though. I, I they were. He did. They were. Re- I don't. Did you listen to our commentary? Were you I, one of the? No, not yet. Were you one of the twenty people? Because there were t- there were times where I felt like he was just taking rounds off. Where like he where like his heart wasn't in the fight anymore, and he was you know to, oh, to, again, to coin a phrase were, coast coasting to victory. There were certain they both took rounds off. I mean, there's I'm not disputing that, but there were enough rounds where you could where you could see an argument for him to win. This again, this wasn't the case of if you oh, to- clearly didn't win the round. I'm going to give it to him anyway. One of the arguments that Pat and I made was that it didn't feel it, it felt like the only way that you could give some of those rounds to Canelo was if you're totally discounting the jab as an effective punch. Yes. I I agree with that being the primary point of argument and I also know that there are boxing judges who score that way. Well, that's that's a robbery. You're you're that that's, that's like that's like not counting leg kicks in MMA. Hey, then how many years did we did we suffer through that being a legitimate? And they were block? robberies. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, speaking of robberies, we also did an in, we also did a TV party for Insatiable season one. Um, oh, well, hang on. The last thing about my scoring about the scoring for that fight. Mm-hmm. The I did not know this about boxing judges sitting ringside. Apparently, they don't have monitors. Okay. They literally have to watch from ringside. And that is just a horrible, horrible way to score those fights. Yeah, well, you when at I, least need to I, see the camera. When hands. I was an amateur MMA judge, I didn't get a monitor. I'm lucky I got a pencil. That's a, okay, that's amateur. That's amateur scoring for amateur fights. That's not the biggest boxing event of the year. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, and if you're a communist and a homosexual, you'll love our take on source material. Exit stage left the Snagopus Chronicles. It's a it was a, a hit for communists and homosexuals nationwide. I don't think you're qualified to speak for either the communist party or the homosexual group, seeing as you belong to neither category. I don't know. Ronnie would Ronnie Adams would diff, would uh, disagree with you. We had a raucous debate over whether or not Bert and Ernie are gay today, in which case I was called a communist and a homosexual several times with an agenda that I was pushing on Ronnie. Uh, I don't know. That, that <laughs> seemed, I mean, look, A, who cares? If Bert and Ernie can't be gay or straight, they're puppets. They can be. They absolutely no. can be. They are characters. Puppets. Characters. They have nothing below the waist. It doesn't matter. Again, have, your ability to have sex does not mean you you can't love somebody of the same sex. All puppets are asexual. You're asexual. No. I thought I was for a while, but no. <laughs> Ew. Stop. You brought it up. Uh, and I'm sorry I did. So for my wedding anniversary, I'm taking my wife to Jimmy Hart's famous bar and Tiki Deck because Conrad Thompson won't stop talking about it on his other podcasts. This seems like a bad idea. We'll see. I'll have a review for your people. We'll have a, we'll have a special podcast review uh, once my wife and I get back from our wedding anniversary. So she says she's up for it, man. She's excited. Uh, I'm, again, it just seems like a bad idea to do anything involving Jimmy Hart. <laughs> it's the same weekend as Venom, so we'll have a lot to talk about when we do our Venom review. Maybe instead of reviewing Venom, we'll talk about my trip to Daytona. I am more than happy to let you blabber. No, no. This is only acceptable if I know beforehand we're going to do that for 90 minutes. <laughs> so I can avoid seeing the movie. No, you have to still see the movie. I am not. No, no. If I'm going to see the movie, you are vetoed from discussing your <laughs> anniversary. Fair enough. All right, take me home, Jeeves. 
All right. On that needlessly pedantic and wandering note, thank you everyone for suffering through this with us. We appreciate your patronage. Don't know why you choose to patronize us, but you do. Uh, again, Mark just went over the schedule that will be upcoming, so you can look forward to all of those shows. Should be a lot of fun this Sunday. Oh, who won? Mark uh, Hunt or the other heavyweight? Atlantic submitted him in the first. Ugh. Really nice rear naked choke. Cool. Mark Hunt hit Olenek flush in the face with the right hand, and Olenek just gave him a thumbs up. It was a great moment. <laughs> awesome. I mean, the other heavyweight fight was just ass. Just so much. I wasn't asking about that one. Uh, but if you want who's my John, full review... Who's John Jones fighting at UFC 230? He's not. Oh. I thought the headline was that he was. No, we haven't even received a specific... No, we don't even know when his suspension's up. He's his, there's no official ruling about him in USADA yet. Oh, what was so? What was the headline about the other day about him uh, at UFC 230? There's nothing about him in UFC 230. I saw something, but it's not. I don't. I don't want to ruin what's left of this recording by trying to look it up on my slow ass computer. No, UFC 230 doesn't have a main event yet. They're going to announce it at some point this week, probably at the press conference for Nurmagomedov and McGregor. It'll probably uh, yeah, end up being Brock Lesnar versus uh, John Brock Jones. Brock is not eligible to compete in the UFC yet. Nah, I don't think that'll stop him. I mean, look, if Brock's coming back to fight, he's going to fight DC. He's not going to fight John Jones. Okay, end the show. But no, yeah, UFC 230 does not have a main event just yet. There's probably rumors about it being John, but again, we there's not actually a ruling on his drug suspension. Speaking of drug suspensions, Brock Lesnar is not eligible to fight until January of 2019. Uh, but if you want more MMA news, the 411 Ground and Pound radio show on Sundays is a great one. It's the one I it's the other show I host here. We talk about cards, fights that went down, news that happened, all the all that good stuff. Uh, sadly, on the MMA front, uh, Norfumi Kid Yamamoto passed away a couple of, either yesterday or the day before. Uh, really sad. For those of you who might remember him from his run in Japan. Uh, only 41, man. Cancer sucks. Yeah, it does. Uh, but this coming sun this coming Sunday we'll have a review of UFC Fight Night 137, which is a shambles of a card. It had its main event fall through again for like the third or fourth time. It's now Tiago Santos versus Eric Anders at light heavyweight. It's not a good card, but you can hear uh, I'm blanking on names. Jeff and I talk about the few fights that are kind of worth looking at, um, and again you can listen to that. So that'll be it. A lot of fun this coming Sunday. Uh, apart from that, again, I'll be back for the Iron Fist show. Which will, this will be an interesting contrast because Mark and I both kind of enjoyed Iron Fist season one, while everyone else just hated it. There's been a lot more positive buzz about the second season, but again, I'm I'm a bit into it and I'm really struggling with it. So once again, I will be you know the opposite of general perspectives. So, we'll talk about that. I might be wrong. It might flip-flop by the time it what it wraps up, and I'll think it's great. So, until then, thank you again for listening. For Mark, I'm Robert. Stay safe, and please continue to be well, be safe, and behave. Tell me what you gon' do to me Confrontation ain't nothing new to me You could bring a bullet, bring a sword, bring a morgue But you can't bring the truth to me Alexa, play Kendrick Lamar and SZA Okay With Amazon Music, a voice is all you need Get tens of millions of songs Download the Amazon Music app today